Hello everyone and welcome to this video in which I'm going to discuss the control board of Scotty's spectrum analyzer that I'm building. This control board really has two purposes. The first one is to power the remaining boards of the system, usually that is with a 10 volts, and the second one is to allow for a computer to be connected to the control board and to then send commands through the control board to, to the various parts of the system. This is the schematic of, of um, the control board. And that's my own schematic because um, as I read it, the boards, I had to, um, to redraw the schematics, obviously. So there is also another schematic by Scotty himself on his website, although um, the, the differences are really minimal. Um, it's mostly that I left out a few things that I was sure I didn't need. Um, in any case, this schematic is also online and there is a readme file outlining the details of what is different um, here compared to, to Scotty's original version. There is uh, three sections in this schematic. The top one here takes care of the I.O. There is a, a header connecting to the computer um, and uh, various latches here uh, connecting to the other boards for digital I.O. Um, that is um, the 10 volts supply here and the last part is a voltage doubler that, uh, that doubles the input voltage um, um, for example, from, from 10 to 20 volts or from 12 to 24 volts. And we're going to look at each of these parts in a bit more detail and start with uh, the, the regulator part that generates the 10 volts. This is the main power input of the spectrum analyzer. You're supposed to apply 13.6 or thereabouts volts from a wall ward to, to this connector here and this goes through a 10 volt regulator, which obviously gives you 10 volts out, that are then accessible um, from these 16 uh, connectors over here and to power the remaining boards, as I said. This is then fed into uh, a second regulator uh, that's a 5 volt regulator to power the 5 volts logic that you have locally on, on that board. And I added an LED because LEDs are cool. But anyway, this is fairly standard. Um, there isn't much that is really interesting in this section of the board because that's just two regulators. But still, I want to highlight two things. First, at the input note that there is one and a second ferrite bead here and this reverse biased diode. This is a crowbar circuit and its uh, purpose is to protect the whole system from reverse polarity if you if you plug in the wrong wall art or, or whatever. Now, how does this work? Usually when everything is fine, this, this uh, diode here is reverse biased, so, so everything is basically operating normally and the ferrite beads might actually uh, contribute a little bit to, to noise immunity, but, uh, but anyway. Um, but as soon as you invert the polarity by mistake, you're diode becomes forward biased because there is a drop from here to here that is positive. So you're going to have a very high current flowing through that diode because there is nothing in the way the, the current can flow from here through this ferrite bead through the diode back through the second um, ferrite bead. And um, the idea is then that uh, this ferrite bead or that one actually either of the two acts as a fuse and hopefully blows and, and uh, protects uh, and the, the, the spectrum analyzer. In fact, there is quite a number of ways to get uh, reverse polarity protection and this is, this is one of them. And when, I, when I'm going to redesign this board for USB operation, we might take a look at these different solutions and trade-offs that are involved. Um, but um, for now, uh, I just adopted what Scotty has here. The second thing that is mildly interesting is this diode here that is drawn in pencil because uh, I actually forgot to put it. It's not, it's not a big deal because this is a TO220 uh, package so I can just wrap it around. But anyway, um, this diode normally is reverse biased and it's, it's a very good idea to put such a diode unless the data sheet of the regulators tells, tells you that, that it's not necessary. This diode becomes forward biased when the output is at higher voltage than the input. Normally that's not the case, but it, it might happen during maybe inductive kickbacks or um, 
if you if you're drawing very little current and then you disconnect the output this capacitor here might uh, discharge slower than this one and then you end up in the, with the situation that you have lower an input voltage than an output voltage and in that situation this diode becomes forward biased and protects the regulator um, from from damage uh, by just keeping the input and the output at approximately the same voltage level this part of the schematic takes care of doubling an input voltage. That is, if you apply 10 volts, you get roughly 20 volts out. And uh, before we look at how this is actually achieved by this circuit, there is something I want to note here. Um, this 10 ohms resistor here, together with this uh, 10 microfarad shunt capacitor, forms an RC filter, uh, filtering out high frequency components of, um, um, of the input. And in fact, at the output, there is the same filter topology, 10 ohms, 10 microfarad shunt capacitor in two stages. So this is really heavily filtered. And the reason for that is this output goes to the VCO and uh, you don't want to have any noise in there, particularly because this is a switching part. So, so it's a good idea to, to, to filter that. Um, but this begs for the question why, you, why you're not always doing that. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, RC filter is going to give you much better uh, filtering than just a capacitor across the rails. And uh, the reason is pretty simple. Uh, although this has superior filtering, imagine you were drawing, uh, let's say, one amp um, through, through this resistor. You'd actually have a drop of 10 volts here because this is a 10 ohms resistor. So it, this is really not applicable for any high current situation. And in fact, um, this all plays together because you're only going to draw very little current. This is why you can use this charge pump that we're about to discuss. And this also allows you to, to get away um, with this, uh, with this uh, 10 ohms resistor here. This 10 ohms resistor has an additional uh, pretty nice um, purpose actually. Um, if you want to know how much current draw you have from here, you can just measure the drop across this resistor and use Ohm's law to figure out the current. Otherwise you'd somehow have to insert an amp meter in there and then it gets annoying because, uh, because you have to, to sort of interrupt your circuit to, to put it in there. Um, so this is, a, this is a very nice trick anyway. The voltage doubling itself is done by the TC7662 chip, which is a uh, charge pump uh, charge pump controller essentially. And uh, in fact, you can use this chip both to generate uh, a negative supply, that is if you apply 10 volts, you get negative 10 volts out, as well as doubling your input voltage, and you can even do both together. Um, in fact, Scotty's design um, has, a, uh, has both a 20 volts rail as well as a negative 10 volts rail, but I decided that I, I didn't really need the negative 10 volts rail, so I left that out. Anyway, how does this work? If you look at the block diagram from the data sheet, and this is really a very nice data sheet, so it's really worth a read. It has ample theory of operation, as well as uh, it tells you really what you should and shouldn't do with this chip. Anyway, if you look at the data sheet, um, there is these two transistors here. Um, if you watched my video on voltage level translation, you'll notice that this is a, this is a push-pull stage. So this node here, gets shorted to ground or to the to the supply voltage um, depending on the gate state here which really means that you're, you're gonna have a square wave on the cap plus pin and um, that is controlled um, by by this uh, by these blocks here and in fact um, you can set this to 10 kilohertz or 35 kilohertz but that's just details I mean you can just look at the data sheet if you're interested in that but anyway there is a square wave at the cap plus pin that is the the take-home message here and if we look at the cap plus here in my schematic is connected to this capacitor which is then connected to these two diodes and so on. And um, this is actually really a voltage doubling circuit. Mm, so if you're interested in that I link in. Dave Jones has a, a, a pretty extensive discussion of precisely this circuit. So I link that in 
Um, and the only thing I have to add to, to what he said is, uh, if you use Schottky diodes here, which is the case, of course, uh, then um, you're going to have higher in output voltage because essentially your output voltage is going to be two times the input voltage minus the drops across the diodes minus uh, whatever efficiency losses you have in there. Um, thus, it makes sense to have a Schottky diodes with a, with a low uh, forward voltage drop to get as high a voltage as you can possibly um, get. The rest of the schematic takes care of sending measurement data from the spectrum analyzer to the computer as well as allowing the computer to command the spectrum analyzer. So this means that there is input and output. From the perspective of the computer, um, the input is sending back the measurement data. And that's what these four lines here, one, two, three, four, um, are. So uh, there is this header here that you connect to, to various boards. And these boards are going to send data um, through this header, through this trace here, um, and to the parallel port. In fact, um, these pull-up resistors here are optional. This doesn't mean that, that uh, you don't have to put them. It means that, and I, this comes from memory, I'm not really sure about that. But anyway, I, I think that there was an early standard of the parallel port that didn't really specify whether you had to have these pull-up resistors, also didn't specify impedances, and, and then people started to get fast and really needed control impedance on, on these lines. And, and this is where it was specified that you have to have these pull-up resistors built into your computer. So um, if, if your uh, computer respects that uh, second standard, then um, these are already built in and you don't have to populate them. So what I will do is I will, um, I will uh, build my control board without these pull-ups, then just measure whether uh, I have uh, um, high voltage on these pins. And if I do, it means that the pull-ups are built into the computer and I will not populate them. Now, in terms of output, if you look at the whole thing, there is one, two, three, four output headers that you connect to various boards of the spectrum analyzer. So that's four times eight bits. But there is only eight um, bits of, of data lines um, that come from the parallel port. So in a way, this has to be multiplexed, and that's what these logic chips here do. But first, um, let's look at, so for example, the, um, this line here goes through that resistor, which actually has a shunt capacitor to ground, and D7 is then connected to all of the four logic chips. Uh, at first I thought that uh, this was a, a series termination, but the resistor is, is far too large for that. So I think this is just um, some, uh, some um, noise filtering um, thing here. Um, but in the end, um, it's all connected to these logic chips. Um, and what they do is, these are um, 74ACT573, which are essentially D-latch with a tristatable transparent output. So what does that mean? If we look at one of the chips, uh, there is a, a part from ground and your supply pin, eight input pins, eight output pins, a latch enable and uh, inverted output enable. The output enable um, could be used to tri-state the output. Um, but this is wired to ground, which means that um, um, essentially the output is never tri-stated. You could use that if you were to implement bidirectional communication or things like that. You could then sort of tri-state the output um, uh, while you're not sending. But anyway, um, so we're, we're going to ignore that because the output enable is tied to ground. The latch enable um, <laughs> enables the latch. So when you pull this guy high, um, whatever you apply at the input is just buffered and sent to the output. So, so that's why this is a transparent latch. But as soon as you pull low, the latch enable, the chip will latch in the values at the input and just buffer them, which means that you can change them and this change is not going to be reflected at the output. So to reiterate over this, um, the eight input bits are all tied together. For example, here we have D7, 
D7 and that's actually also connected to one of uh, the lines, the data lines um, of the parallel port through this RC filter. But they're all tied together. The latch enable on the other hand is specific to each of, uh, of the four chips. So there is one latch enable, two, three and four and these are all individually uh, controllable from the parallel port. And this is how these 8 bits here are multiplexed into 32 bits at the output. Okay, that's it for the schematic. Next, I'm actually going to build up the control board and run a few tests to make sure that it operates properly.